ancient Egypt, home of civilization, mathematics, and low, low prices. Danny Baker, after all. Tonight, Terry Gilliam, Alison Moyer, Lloyd Grossman, your letters, rock and roll shame, and the most secret comedian in Britain. Welcome to After All. Danny Baker will be along shortly. My name's Ted. You know, I was at a Tory party yesterday. But <laughs> 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 I was only there delivering pies. <laughs> I was called upon to make a roaring speech of unification. <laughs> As it turned out, I decided to give them one of my old favourites. What I'd done in the school holidays. <laughs> so a roaring success. Afterwards, Norman Fowler came up to me and said, Ted, he said, Ted, you're the man to lead us into the next election. <laughs> Think of the nation, Ted. <laughs> so, therefore, with some degree of... Ted, Ted, as quick as I, as quick as I could, I got here. Uh, Thank you. How did it go? Lovely. Lovely have, audience. Have Brilliant. Any, have any problem with the autocue? <laughs> no, no, no. No problem with it at all. Jesus, wants to get the next. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, now say hello to the Hallmarks and Verified Railtown Butlers over there. Yeah. How do you do, OK? No cutaways of you looking at him, because that's always a sure sign of editing. <laughs> You see, I, I, was stuck in, I was stuck in traffic yesterday and, and, and this guy comes along by the side of my car and tapped on the, on the windscreen. He was on a motorbike and he said, oh, you telly people, you make me die with your big heads and all your money. Anyone can do what you do. And, uh, well, I don't know, did, did Ted do OK? That's Ted, the man on the... That was Big Ted, yeah, OK. <laughs> I, I'm nothing if not scientific about these things. Hey, folks, look at this mail. That's our mail room. Any day this week, all of those letters are thundering exactly the same thing. They're saying, Baker, after all, boys club, is it? What are you, twinned with that monastery in Sicily? Have a few nightmares about tunnels with rows of teeth, do we? Let's get some gals on the gag, for God's sake. All right, all right. Here with Lennon and McCartney enlivened, the trailblazing Pankhurst-esque genius, Alison Moyer. Yeah.
trailblazer. Uh, right to our shame, but it wasn't the way we figured it. The first woman in, in uh, now we're on show four. Uh, it gives me, it stops me getting grief when I get indoors. My wife is actually in the audience tonight. Wen's up there in the audience. And, mwah! <laughs> that buys me something. Um, <laughs> I cannot, I can never, I can never um, do that showbiz thing of saying my wife's up there, stand up, Wen. A, because she figures that drags you in and makes you look like a showbiz wife when she's virtually a person in her own right. <laughs> And, and uh, she said to me, uh, the couple of times I've done it, she said to us, uh, don't do that, you don't, you don't get what I get. I said, well, it's just a little thing, and you know, people applaud politely, and it's all over. She went, oh, yeah. And as I stand up, I hear the applause, and I, I, she says, particularly the women, it's got to be said, say, oh, she ain't much, is she? <laughs> we were on holiday in, in uh, Florida. Yes, I'm going to tell it. We were on holiday <laughs> in Florida, and Don Johnson, that's how well-heeled the hotel it was, Don Johnson was there. And Melanie Griffiths. So I said, wow, Don Johnson. By the pool we were, there's Don Johnson. And, uh, and I said, oh, Melanie Griffiths in the pool. She said, oh, yeah. She ain't much, is she? <laughs> <laughs> and then said the cattiest thing I've ever heard. I think it was. Said, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not being up on the moon. I'm just saying, she did lose a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> did lose. Uh, we're going to be topical right now with the top ten list. So far we've tried not to tread on Angus Dayton's toes, but sometimes it's just irresistible. Uh, you can't have picked up any paper this week without seeing that uh, Lady Thatcher's memoirs are being published and she's given a hard time to most of her ex-colleagues, if, if they're to be believed, before they're published. However, going through them with our own researchers, we have found another top ten revelations that are also in Lady Thatcher's memoirs. Uh, we've gone through it and we found out that the, these, that the things that are in have been overlooked. Papers are too busy looking for political backbiting to go with these things. But if you read them, you'll find these are in there too. The top ten other revelations in Lady Thatcher's memoirs. Stephen. <laughs> Number ten. Boast that without her vision and leadership, the shopping channel would have remained only a dream. <laughs> Number nine. Watch footage of Windsor Castle on fire screeching, burn, baby, burn. <laughs> Eight is somehow fourth in line for a shot at Lennox Lewis. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Seven, to this day tells people she met Dennis when he was in the E Street Band. <laughs> Six, whenever Colin Moynihan called, would open door, humorously stare above his head, say, well, nobody here, and close the door again. <laughs> Number five, feels her position on slavery largely misunderstood. Number four. Eye surgery in 85 calls by unshakable belief she could walk through walls. <laughs> Number three, initially sent task force to Falklands in belief it was Elvis's house. <laughs> Two, is bald like Eric Letter. <laughs> And the number one revelation in the Margaret Thatcher book, despite the pleading of publishers, she's still calling the thing, we are a memoirs. There you go. That's noisy, isn't it? Yes, we looked at the papers this week. Uh, our researchers have found that entirely while they're earning that £2,000 a week. Did many of you see the article about uh, the little girl, three and a half, and claim to be perhaps the cleverest child in Britain? Well, the big deal is she's here with us tonight, so say a polite but never patronising hello to Katerina Navaya Jimenez and her mother, Jackie, right there. <laughs> Jackie, how did this happen? Well, in the first instance, I didn't even notice it happening. Mm -hmm. My first child, I had no idea of what children should do or are capable of until health visitors and such like started to mention to me that she was ahead at various things. In mean, what ways? I mean, how do you, how, when did the you know, coin drop and say, wow, you know, this is, there's no beating around the book? Well, everything. Kid. She sat early, she walked early, she talked early. She was out of nappies at nine months old. Um, she, count, she was counting, she was speaking Spanish and French. Her alphabet... You speak Spanish and French? Her alphabet, yeah. reading, writing. She surpasses the infants already. I mean, some of her tests go up to the equivalent of a seven-year-old. You're going to talk to us tonight, Katerina, because you didn't want to earlier on. What do you say? Do you know you're very clever? Yeah? Answer in any language you feel free <laughs> to. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? We may have been sold a pup here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many does she speak? She, um, Spanish is really her, her second language, and then French, 
And she's three she, and a half. She was three in March. Yeah. So the problems that brings, because I understand, uh, we'll talk about the upside in a minute, because I hate when people make out it's all problems. It's mm -hmm. not. No. Uh, there's a financial one, right? Oh, definitely. Um, the only education that would cater for her needs is private. Uh, but the, the fees are out of my reach at this moment in time. Yeah. As a lone parent. Sure. Katerina, what is your favourite language? Which one do you like to speak the best? Dilo tu. Speak to her in Spanish, if you understand. Dilo tu. Dilo que queres que prefires. That, that's not Spanish, that's a moon man language. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> really? But uh, you said she can get rebellious. I mean, we found out earlier on that if you say day, she'll say night, yeah? You say talk, she'll say no. I say black, she says white. Oh, yeah. Everything. She's better with other people than she is with me. Does that come with the, the, uh, the, the IQ? Yes, it, it's the frustration um, that she suffers through mm -hmm. not having the adequate stimulation. Yeah. That makes her very, very rebellious. On the upside, then, br just briefly, what are the, the, what are the positive sides of having a genius child? That I'm very proud of her. Mm -hmm. She's a very, um, she's very demanding, but she has a very adult conversation. Yeah. It's, it's difficult re to remember that she is still a baby. Mm -hmm which is a problem from her point of view, because I may sort of treat her as an older child. Who are you waving to? <laughs> Who are you waving to, mate? Come on, t t one word, anything. Just know. make me feel better. I'm virtually your intellectual equal here. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> Come on, t t say something in Spanish, Katarina. Come on, say computer game in Spanish. <laughs> we were playing before we came on, weren't we? A computer game, yeah? And I gave her a damn good thrashing. <laughs> <laughs> but a long way to go now. Say, what, what, what is your name to your toys here? No? No, I can dig that. It's the same with Michael Winner for 20 minutes, so... <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just cut out losses and say, yeah, sure, good luck with the jacket, and you're a great kid. I know you're going to be great. Thank you very much, Katarina. Yep. Shake hands. Oh, I'll shake hands oh. with a bear. This is what it's coming to. <laughs> Katarina and Jackie right here. <laughs> Thanks, mate. I can't believe I stood there and crowed about being a three-year-old half-year-old child at Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> they told me in the wings, they said, stop boasting you beat her at Mario, the kid's three and a half. <laughs> and I did it on the air. <laughs> <laughs> now let's enter that Bermuda Triangle of intellect, the world of presenting and popular rock music. Last week, I asked you if you'd observed any uh, great titles, covers, or lyrics from the history of rock and roll that strike you as particularly dopey. Well, covers themselves are shaping up. How about this gem? The first one this week, sent to us from Carol Twigger. It's from 1967, and it's the swinging sound of the Larry Page Orchestra with an album called Executive Suite. Before we see the artist himself, let us digest here the rugged swagger of the 1967 liner notes. It says, on the back here, just about here, it says... Uh, you have my permission to collapse, Miss Jones, but first, mix me a seven o'clock tail. <laughs> and put an album on the stereogram. My God, none of your electronic neurosis. Give me something that unwinds the mind. One by that Larry Page fellow. Now there's a man with taste. That's what it says there. And Larry himself? <laughs> That's Larry right there in the black and white hoop dress. <laughs> there, a fine figure of a man, Larry himself, 1967. And this, I don't know what, let me just show you this. This is from uh, Liverpool, this was sent to us. There it is. <laughs> My Bonnie lies over the ocean. I, I, why are they, you know, moaning about the yoke of capitalist oppression when they've got rocking bands like that? I... Oh, we're on the ball tonight. <laughs> it's taken us four weeks to get it together, but uh, mind you, somewhere in China, they're probably holding up this right now. It's Rick Wakeman's album, <laughs> No Earthly Connection. Amongst many preposterous concepts that Rick has bought us, no earthly connection. This album here was perhaps, perhaps the most preposterous. Not such a bad cover, except it used to come, anyone who knows this in the audience, it used to come with a square of tin foil that you had to roll up into a tube 
and then you could place it there and then see the cover properly. It used to come with this little bit of tin foil. Yes, this is how far out rock and roll got. Now, I used to try that and I'd lay the cover down and get the angles right, and, and it was always too dark. And there was always the chance you were going to put your eye out. <laughs> An outrageous concept, and 15 years on, it's time the man Wakeman explained himself. <laughs> Hello, Rick Wakeman. Good evening. Hey! <laughs> yes, it is. This is Danny. Yeah, what, I, ought to ex I ought to explain, it's all right for people like Michael Jackson who've got, like, Pepsi-Cola sponsor him. I had Bago foil, I had no... <laughs> <laughs> Rick? Tell us about it. Talk us through this cover, because I and none of my friends could ever make this work. What was the idea behind the, the art cover here? Well, there was, a, there was an art director called Mike Dowd. Yeah. Who was, um... Well, actually, he was one of those nice guys who was sort of trying to save this planet while living on a totally different one. I see, yeah. And, uh, he came up with this concept that he saw in, in Amsterdam of, of, of art being something that it wasn't by looking at it from different angles. And he sold it to you, Rick. I'm afraid he did, yes. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, it wasn't quite as, as bad as the one he sold me with the King Arthur cover. What was the King Arthur cover? Well, the King oh. Arthur cover, that was the one where I wanted to have the Lady of the Lake with the old sword coming out. That's but right, it was, it was the Lady of the Lake, I remember, pushing the sword out. Uh, that's yeah, right, well, actually, it was, it was in the middle of November, and they said, well, what we'll do, we'll just take a picture of the lake, and then we'll paint the sword. And I said, no, I want the real thing. So we, we, we rented this girl, um, <laughs> nice girl she was. And uh, she came and said, what do I have to do? And we said, you've got to go in the water and, and hold the sword up. Mm. And it was November and there was ice on the water oh. and everything. She Many wasn't... takes, was it, Rick? Many takes? Well, it was interesting because in the end she insisted we got her a wetsuit and she went under there and she came out with hypothermia about an hour later. Um, <laughs> but there, it was pretty good. She was going to sue, but uh, my drummer warmed her up, so R she was Rick? all right. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it now. Stop dragging us into rock and roll hell. Rick, uh, I, I want you to come down and sit in the studio because you are one of the most entertaining raconteurs to come out of the rock and roll era. All I need tonight, and by the way, we've been putting up a, a photo of you that couldn't be more flattering. Oh. <laughs> all, <laughs> all I need at the moment is just on behalf of everyone who bought this album and, and gave themselves some eye damage, could you just say, Britain, I apologise. That's all I want. Oh, well, do I have to apologise to Bago Foil as well? No, Bago Foil, the deal's safe. Britain, oh, is it? Go oh, on, okay. go on. Listen, Britain, I'm ever so sorry, but you wait for the new cover. Oh, all right. That's your Rick Wakeman right there. <laughs> well, as JB said, please, 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 swamp us with uh, that sort of thing. And in return, you get one of our exclusive but deranged T-shirts. <laughs> There's the gang. <laughs> how, how can I take it out of that Rick Wakeman shot when that comes up? But now the hits just keep on coming on after all because my next co-pilot is a man who has kept his own substantial rock and roll roots well hidden until right now. This man virtually invented the counterculture, believe me. So hold high your lighters <laughs> to <laughs> underground journalist, unsung king of rock and roll, historian and actual ex-rock musician in his own right, the Lloyd Grossman. <laughs> I never understood those fancy handshakes. Look, Wait, shall I show you? No, 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 no. Was that really Rick Wakeman? Yes, really Rick Wakeman. Well, no, like there's a bogus Rick Wakeman walking around out there. <laughs> I don't know. I People thought it might be one of those no, Rick Wakeman No, Rick Wakeman from the Isle of Man. Yeah, he couldn't make it tonight, but we wanted to get him on the phone. Explain further what I was talking about there. This is no gag. You were part of the counterculture. I can culture. never explain what you're talking about. Well, San Francisco, you were part of the underground culture. I right? was part of the uh, counterculture when underground journalism was having its sort of first... Uh, in what way? Little flutter. I was writing for a lot of underground newspapers. Which one? Largely in Boston. Well, I started with Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. I then went to work for an even more pretentious one called the New York Review of Rock. Yeah. And when that was insufficiently pretentious, I went to work <laughs> for something called Vibrations, the Journal of the Contemporary Zeitgeist. <laughs> so what were you saying to the barriers, you know, to the barricades, brothers and sisters, tear down capitalism? Was it that kind of shtick? No, I mean it was a lot of sort of deep searching analysis of Mick Taylor's first solo album. You ah, know, that's I mean yeah. a real undergraduate. Who were um, your heroes then? Who were my heroes then? Um, the Kinks, the Kingsmen, yeah. um, Bo Diddley has always been one of my great heroes. Yeah. 
Um, but I liked all the really weirdo bands, you know, like Quatermass. I loved Quatermass. I loved the nice Bonzo Dog band, one of the great underrated British bands ever. So how comes this, uh, people tend to think of you as, oh, that ultra smoothie, you know, al almost, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know this about you, but almost bland Only relatively. Who, does, uh, uh, who does the uh, cookery program or yeah. whatever. How, when did you sever your rock and roll roots? Was it a conscious decision? No, I think rock and roll severed me from, uh, from the oh, uh, yeah? thing. I, I finally uh, got a single recorded. And Did it you? shot up to the dizzying heights of Tell us book. about it. What was it? Well, it hit number 47 in the charts. And, um, Our charts? In your charts. And it was only stopped. I'm convinced to this day it was December 1977. It was only kept from number one by Mull of Kintyre. <laughs> and uh, I've never spoken to McCartney since What then. about those other 45 places between them? Oh, they, they were just sort of, <laughs> uh, you know, making a bit of room for us. So but, that was the uh, period it was in the charts? That, yes, it was uh, December 77. It was around the same time that Plastic Bertrand had his great hit. Uh, what were you called? Remember. We were called Jet Bronx and the Forbidden. You were Jet Bronx? <laughs> I, someone had to be. <laughs> it was a, a, a dirty job, but someone had to do it. And um, when I got to number 47, I was so dazzled by my own preeminence that I decided I should give up. You know, rather like Michael Jordan quitting basketball, mm -hmm. I thought, leave at the top, kid. Yeah. So yeah. I walked away. Did you have a, a following? Were you a, did you have groupies? Well, I, I think my father bought a couple of dozen singles, <laughs> and uh, that substantially helped it in its rise up the chart. Did I have groupies? Yeah. I think I was a bit too old for groupies by then, but I mean there were always sort of girls hanging around my earlier bands. But is, is that what you wanted to be? You wanted to be a, a groupie? Rock, no, a rock star. <laughs> yeah, I did actually. So did you go I to festivals and stuff? Were you at Woodstock? No, sadly my mother didn't let me go to Woodstock. And that, <laughs> and that was um, an extremely... Uh, that sort of slightly dented my counterculture. Seriously, your mother didn't let you go? My mother thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> You want to go all the way to upstate New York to sit in mud, she said, you know. So, um, no, I didn't, get to, I didn't get to Woodstock. So Jet Bronx wanted to go to Woodstock, but said, <laughs> Mum, can I go? <laughs> yeah, and she didn't. <laughs> well, I, but you, keep, you also were in another band. I didn't know you were in Jet Bronx. You were in Sunny Snatch and the Swell Sunny Shoes. Sunny Snatch and the Swell Shoes, yes. <laughs> that was, that was well, actually my favourite name for a band. And when I got that band together, I was about 16, and uh, once again, my mother, because mothers were very important yeah. in this whole sort of suburban rock thing. My mother said, uh, have you thought of a name for your new band, dear? And I said, um, yes, I have. And she said, what's it called? I said, it's called Sunny Snatch and the Swell Shoes. And she said, oh, I like the Swell Shoes. Mm, uh, yeah, there, there's mums. <laughs> and it comes to this. And, it comes, and here's a crunching gear change. Here's your chat yeah. show right here. We've been talking about the counterculture <laughs> to the barricades, brothers and sisters out, demons out. Up you've against the wall, mothers, yes. Up against the wall, mothers. <laughs> Lloyd, you've got this new book on dogs out now. Uh, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. Because, um, well, I realised, you know, I looked around and I saw that the world was full of a lot of sad old hippies like Danny <laughs> Baker, who now own dogs with them, like, what's your dog called? Twizzle. 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 Um, and, yeah. you know, learning to love dogs, again, is part of that experience of ah, really getting well. sort of bourgeois, you know. And Sunny Snatch in the Swell Shoes, can we get you back in the saddle one more time? Yeah. We got the band. <laughs> <laughs> we got the band. We got the axe. Come on, Lloyd. I, I, Come on, Lloyd. <laughs> Bruce. Bruce. I have seen I have seen the episode of, of Baywatch in which David Hasselhoff goes to his high school reunion. He took more persuading and, than uh, you are. And <laughs> his, his ex-girlfriend said to him, "Oh, come on, get back up and play." And he went, "No, no." And they eventually dragged him up to the. Well, you can. You know, well, let me say this, and you get up there, I'll folks. We may never get the Beatles back together again, but tonight <laughs> you can say you were there when Sonny Snatch picked up his axe right over there. <laughs> slight sort of uh, image change um, because if you notice you've got to be as good as Eric Clapton to look like a merchant banker when you play guitar I mean the older Clapton gets the more conventional he looks so I'm gonna get rid of these spectacles because really only Buddy Holly or Bo <laughs> could wear spectacles and um, I'll give this it's not quite the James Brown routine I should have come out in a dressing gown with my <laughs> name written on it um, this is going to be it's a bit high for me. 
I usually was a part of the loose slung family of guitarists. Um, this is going to be a bit of uh, garage rock. <laughs> so called because uh, when we were in bands as teenagers, our parents were so horrified they made us practice in the garage. Except for my mother who made me practice in the neighbor's garage. Um, right, shall I start? <laughs> Ready? Talks it like he walks it, huh? No problem at all with that. I used to hate songs that ended like that, didn't you? No. When you, oh, yeah, when you go to concerts and like you start clapping, they're still going. <laughs> Good gig. Uh, we've got time for some serving suggestions. We can do some serving suggestions, can't we? A couple of serving suggestions. A little palette clearer, the serving suggestions. Uh, the kind of stuff people have found in supermarkets for us and sent them to us. Uh, it's not after all. We're not doing the show unless we have something from Summerfield. Uh, there's, Summerfield's, uh, there's Summerfield's own. Try that. There's a, see that? that? That one there? It's Summerfield's own. It's uh, Ratatouille. And they suggest that if you want to eat it, you better look at it through a letterbox. Look at that. <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's the serving suggestion right there. Uh, here's another one along the similar. This, we, got, we got hundreds of these. How long have you got? There's another one right there. Can you see that? Where are we on three? See that? It's a kipper fillets. It's the uh, John West's own 190 gram kipper fillets. Again, it's just take them out of the uh, box. That's the kipper fillets. Hey, oh, I tell a lie. I t there is a serving suggestion on there. Look at this. It's a piece of rope. <laughs> now, <laughs> take your rope, uh, warm the oven first, give it about 20 minutes, and mm, that's good rope. <laughs> On, on, a, on a, simil a similar theme, uh, this comes from Douglas Ball in Sittingbourne. It's a variation. It's kind of similar, but a variation. It's from the very good people at uh, Truewear, run-resistant tights, 
And look at this, okay? Can you see the run resistant tights? And it's a variation on that wording. Hell knows why they stuck this on there. But if you look down here, see what it says? This photograph is for guidance only. <laughs> I mean, feel free, uh, you know, to slip them over both your heads and rob some banks. <laughs> what is it? They won't, we know they won't make our legs look like that. And this is the best of all. This was sent to us. Uh, it's a gun advertisement. Obviously, it's an American magazine. It's a gun adver advertisement from Adrian Oldershaw. American magazine, but it's on sale here. It's an ad for real guns. And again, look right down here, the piece we've highlighted, you see? Right there, can you see it? And it says, I understand these guns should not be used to commit crime or inflict pain upon innocent persons. <laughs> so just sign that and off it goes. You're absolved. But what magazine do you suspect this comes from? Adventurer? Survivalist? De Niro? No. Swear to God, this was sent to us, uh, yeah, Adrian Oldershaw sent us it, and he sent us the actual magazine cover. It comes from Hairdo Ideas. <laughs> this ad for guns comes from Hairdo... Where is the historical link between the guns and the hairdos? <laughs> Dallas, 63. Sarge? I think I can see a gun butt coming out that window up there. Never mind about that. That woman's fringe is ludicrous. <laughs> it's a disgrace. <laughs> one more. Let's do another one. This is just a hardy annual. This is a hardy annual. Put the fax number up during this, Janet, so people know where to send this kind of stuff. This is a hardy annual. This uh, foreign culture is not coming to grips with the language. It's unfair, but hilarious. <laughs> Nobody knows what guide nails are, OK? Nobody knows what they are, but it's all explained up here in the corner where it says, in on that, to be no hammered more the fingers. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of culture, what kind of culture brings us that language? Why? <laughs> it's a rocking groove. <laughs> These books are made for walking. That's it. No, that's it. That's it. I know, I know the prop costs 75 pounds, but Janet, that's it. <laughs> now those who also entertain, right? Unheralded toiler in showbiz's shadows this week has at one time or another touched all our lives. As a humorous writer, some hang on his every bon mot, while others, they wish to release him in the highlands and hunt him down for sport. My other car's a Porsche. Traffic wardens are nice people. P.S. back in 10 minutes. Don't follow me, I'm lost too. These are just a few of the moments his industry have provided us with. He's the man who writes gags for car stickers, Mr. Tony Collins. Yes, he does. <laughs> We, we couldn't believe there was a bureau that actually did this. We thought it was a long shot. We said in the office, is there a, a body of people who come up with these? And that's just what you do, right? That, absolutely right. Yes, we do. Um, we don't always come up with the original ideas. Um, we have the public phone us, write to us every week, coming up with ideas. So how, how many actual original ideas have you Original got? ideas, mm, the odd one or two. What yeah, would you say time. is your favourite car sticker? Uh, well, I would have to say that one that earns us the most money, and that is uh, the, the bubble sticker, what we call a bubble sticker that says, women like the simple things in life. Like men. Like men. That all, whenever I see that one, it, it puts 10 minutes on my journey. I just, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's not, what is the point of them? What, what does it buy you, having one in your car, do you think? It doesn't buy anything, but it's just, uh, I, I guess, if you've got a sense of humour, it just brings a smile to your face. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you have car stickers in your car? Uh, no. No. <laughs> Well, I guess that's, that, there's the industry right there, uh, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> right there, isn't it? We got a gift for you. We always like to give a gift in this section. It's the complete prose of Woody Allen. Uh, <laughs> you may want to read this, digest it, and hey, you can steal from this because he's not going to want to go back to court just yet, is he? <laughs> so there it is. Ladies and gentlemen, a friend Tony from the car sticker. Oh, yeah? 
Who knew? <laughs> Did you hear these boots are made for walking? Did you hear they were singing that on the previous one? Janet, have we got these boots are made for walking again? Because our dancing and shenanigans may have lost it there. Can we do See if we got it. <laughs> a Chinese version of boots are made for walking. <laughs> Oh, it goes on for several minutes like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these days even footballers are declared to have vision. But vision, true vision, is gifted to the very few indeed. So here now is the eye that never sleeps in that case, perhaps the biggest film director in the world, Terry Gilliam. <laughs> Right. Th that's the kind of new chat show we are. Uh, you're not even in that book, you didn't write it, but you're still plugging it. Well, that's why I can't work out why I'm here, because I have nothing to sell, so I thought, you know, I'd help this man out. Yeah, you have nothing to sell. Let's establish that at the top. Right. Terry, uh, one of the best books I read, and this is not, you didn't write it, and it's, oh, it's older. Is it, is no, this one book? The, no, not that oh, book. Sorry, that's one of the best was selling. Losing the Light, the uh, Mr. Yule's book on the making of Baron Munchausen. It, it is, with, along with the book about the making of Heaven's Gate, just about the most hellish story of movie making, the most mm. unromantic nightmare yeah. you could imagine was it as bad as that yeah it was actually it was, it's a rather tame version of what was going on it's 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 one of those things that, you know it's kind of like every one fantasizes about adventures and romance and 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 and, and you know discovering the nile and all of those yeah. things but the reality is really awful and, and that film was one of those kinds of realities we set out on an adventure to make this this extraordinary film and everything went wrong and I, I went to Rome, was the problem. I wanted to go to Rome to make a movie because I wanted yeah. to be like Federico Fellini and, and not have a stroke, but at least make movies yeah. um, beforehand. <laughs> and, uh, and so I went there and I had this producer who was a, a German, but he, he said we could make this thing for 30% cheaper than anywhere else in the world. So I went there, I storyboarded the film, we scheduled it, we planned it perfectly, and then realized that he had been lying. And uh, <laughs> within the sixth week of the film, of a 20-week shoot, all the money was gone. And they, at that time, were trying to accuse me of misrepresentation and fraud, and were trying to seize all my assets, including my house, while my wife was pregnant with our last child. But see, I've heard of that from uh, film directors before. Take yeah, sure. It's I've, really I've heard. Watch your microphone there. Watch your microphone. Take that with you. No, I'll, um, I'll talk just hold my that up. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> anyone? <laughs> is this all right? Are you getting it? Any, anyone who tunes in now, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> anyone, <laughs> anyone who it? tunes in right now is going to think those pythons they never grow up. They never do. Uh, I, I've heard uh, the I've heard directors say before, oh, and budgets and schedules and storyboards, and you yeah. think, well, you know, that's the business. But actual incidents that happen to you in the making of the film, like elephants. Elephants running right and trampling down sets. Yes, there's one shot in the film where we do this huge track back from uh, the Baron who's about to have his head chopped off. Yep. We start right on the, the, the block in his head and roar back past thousands of Turkish uh, soldiers. And we get to the end of this track and uh, suddenly there's this noise and that's it. The elephants have stampeded and they're they're crushing the Turkish army. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And, then, uh, and that was actually that was actually tame compared to the tiger. That um, oh, that you killed a tiger. We huh? killed the tiger. Yeah. And it's um, and the tiger was brought down, and we needed. I wanted a tiger. Is how are we doing on this? Yeah, that's this fine. Is how it's working. Yeah. Uh, we needed a tiger, and there was going to be a scene in the Sultan's uh, um, tent where, amongst uh, a bed of roses, lay this great Bengal tiger, and so this thing arrived, and it was like a a stuffed tiger that the stuffings had been removed from, but it was a living animal at that time. And I said, I think we better not use this tiger because this tiger's not gonna live much longer. And, and people didn't take me seriously. I thought, you know, you expect directors, everything yeah. they say. And they brought it onto the set and it panicked and it died. And then, the, <laughs> luckily, luckily the- Say it quick enough, the audience don't know. Yeah, I know, they didn't, yeah. they didn't hear that. Yeah. But luckily, the, the, the doctor, the crew doctor was there and he had a, hypodermic full of adrenaline, which he zapped this tiger with and jump-started it. He brought it back to, he reanimated it? He brought it, it back to life. He reanimated the tiger. <laughs> this is true. And, and, and I said, no, that's it. Let's stop there. We, I, wish you know, I'd about that. I wish I'd known about that when Uncle Ted went. <laughs> I really wish I'd known about that stuff. The, the fact was, the, the tiger was such a, I mean, it was a terribly sad creature who just wanted to go home. Yeah, it was, it yeah. Was, Change attack, another thing. You, 
I, if I always figured, if I ever made it to Hollywood or made a film or uh, directed a film, certainly, I would watch the hell. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd always have them out on video and watch them again. It's not the same in TV, mm. but if I did a big shot thing, you don't watch films back, right? No, because it's, 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 I don't know, I'd rather imagine they were good films than be treated to the truth. It's just, they're never as good as I planned them to be. And it's, I think that's the worst thing about making a film. You start with, you know, an idea. I can see the whole thing in my head. And then as you start making it, the whole thing just gets smaller, smaller. You make mistakes. You can't do what you want. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and somehow you get through it. And somehow the film is there. And somehow people like it. Yeah. But I find it really painful to look at them. It's a, uh, I don't know, I yeah. avoid it. Can't leave you without uh, mentioning Monty Python, of course. Did you ever feel 100% Monty Python member? Because it's always, oh, and Terry Gilliam, the peripheral one. Or is that just a, a bad... Yeah, no, that was just, I mean, that was just, they were so terrified of my talent that they always tried mm. to put <laughs> me on the side, make me peripheral to the whole Did thing. Did you used to work here? Did you actually come in the BBC? Yeah, no, no, that's what, I think this is the first time I've been back in a long time, and it was, you know, stages like this that we... Did that? I mean, you've got a much nicer set. You've got yeah. coordinated colors. And but what was it like in those very early days of Python when you had uh, the bust-in audiences? I, I think like the first that. couple of shows were extraordinary because they saw circus and they bust in all these middle-aged <laughs> old ladies. I mean, <laughs> like that. But yeah, and they thought this is going to be a jolly sort of you know Bruce Forsyth with a few talking animals. <laughs> and, and then it started: men in, in women's clothing and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and farty noises and, and <laughs> bad language and, and just. You know, just downright silliness. Yeah. And it, I mean, the sound of these jaws dropping, mass jaws, clunk, <laughs> clunk, mm. clunk. It was like that for the first few shows. And then the BBC was equally confused by it because they kept trying to pull us off the air. They kept changing us to different times. They used to, you know, find the Pythons. It it's all like, been rewritten since, though. Everyone says, oh, we were always into them. They yeah. didn't like us just like they don't like you. <laughs> I'm under a totally different impression, but if you uh, on the way in here, I, I mean, they were all what sort of apologizing here, yeah. saying, you know, sorry. And, 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 and very brief in, uh, on that in the states, the first, did you go with them the first time? The first time they went to the states when they yeah. stiffed on some show over there. I yeah, no, it was, it was in fact it was the Johnny Carson show. So was it? Was, yeah, and we had been we did we had toured England and then we toured Canada and we came down and it was in fact Joey Bishop had taken over the show that night. And, uh, and he introduced, and he said, and it's uh, six guys from London, and uh, they tell me they're funny, let's see. It was that kind of open. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then immediately there's John and Graham in drag talking about, you know, burying the cat. Mm. And then, uh, then there was Graham wrestling with himself. And again, <laughs> it was stunned silence. And, and that was our debut in American television. Yeah. What, what is your favorite piece of Python there? If you look back and say, that, that really... I mean, for my, from yeah. your end of it, I always like Conrad Poos and his amazing dancing teeth, which is Let's a particularly <laughs> fine piece. But yourself, anything? No, I think, I think it was the Undertaker sketch where, the, where John comes into this undertaking establishment with a bag, and in the bag is his dead mother, and mm. he's trying to find out how to yeah. dispose of her. Even it, today, that gets gasps. Yes. I heard one. I know, I know. <laughs> that was the sound, and, you know, and, it, and I can't remember exactly how it went, but there were a variety of things, but eventually it was agreed that they would uh, cook her and eat her, mm. and if they didn't like it, they could throw up into the hole. And yet they called that controversial. What is... What yeah, is and yet they called that controversial. Indeed. indeed. Oh, well, yeah, we were just speaking the truth. Well, Somebody has to say these things. Now you're trying to finish me. You're yeah, I am. Well, one day, I promised I'd shake the hand of the man who made Time Man. It's Terry Thank Gilliam. You. Thank you very much indeed. Has more fun than we do. That's just what I had in mind when we, when we started this thing. There's been a lot about pop and rock on the show tonight, but how refreshing to grab some now that's at last uh, free of any gag, irony, or inference. It is the excellent Alison Moyer and Falling.
you remember this, I was talking about the uh, hair, the original run of hair and why it stopped me ever going to the theatre again. This was last week's show, remember this? And the audience, then they came down off the stage singing Let the Sun Shine In, yeah. and a man positioned himself here, and the old fella was there. <laughs> and they're all singing Let the Sun Shine In. <laughs> Well, uh, we got a letter this week from Vincent Edwards who said, Yep, I was in the original hair. At that time, there's every chance I was the fella at the end of the row naked and put you off the theatre. He's up here in the audience right now. You thought we had enough music? There's a little more to come. This man, Vincent Edwards. Vincent, thanks for your letter. Thanks for coming along. If I might recreate that moment, you're me, 11 years old, looking straight ahead, trying not to notice this fella going, Let the sun shine in. Let the sun shine in. And I think, one time, I think, I, I think it brushed my ear. <laughs> There's only one way to get me over this. Face your demons, go to room 101. If you'll do the act, I'll sit in the end seat. And they, grown-ups, good night. I'll see you next week. <laughs> When dining...